اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ وحدہ والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبی بعد ما بعد Inshallah ta'ala this evening we will continue in our series of lessons in the prophetic seerah the seerah of our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam so far we have covered <coughs> the names of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we have covered uh, the mother and father of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and we've covered the lineage of the Messenger Alaihi Salatu Wasallam tracing all the way back to Adnan uh, and we said that Adnan it is collectively agreed upon that Adnan is from the lineage of Ismail and Ismail Alaihi Salam is the son of Ibrahim Alaihi Salam <coughs> which uh, today inshallah ta'ala we're going to be starting our discussion in the uh, beginning how Mecca became into existence. And I know that uh, maybe a year or two years ago, maybe even three years ago, subhanAllah, uh, we had, wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. We did a, actually we did a lecture on this previously. Um, but it's no problem, inshallah ta'ala, to, uh, to go over uh, this again. <coughs> Especially uh, since uh, we are discussing the prophetic seerah. So, uh, and the reminder benefits the believer. And so today, inshallah ta'ala, I want to discuss uh, how, because there was a point where Mecca was nothing but desert. Mecca was just... Uh, it wasn't Mecca. It wasn't, it wasn't a place. I mean, its location was known. Uh, the people who traveled, it was a valley. <coughs> and people who traveled knew about the valley. Uh, however, it wasn't a place. Nobody lived there. It was just desert. So how did this uh, desert land come to be the Mecca that we know it as, uh, as it is today. Well, actually, the story begins with Ibrahim alayhi uh, salam. The first, we're going to mention, inshallah ta'ala, the two hadith that we're going to read today, <coughs> both from the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari. Um, the first is... Uh, it's the hadith that tells us about when Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he fled uh, his homeland and he entered into, into Egypt. And the Jabbar, <coughs> or the, um, uh, how do you call, what do you say, Jabbar in English, the oppressor? Uh, is that a good translation? Tyrant. Tyrant, there you go. Jazakallah khairah. The tyrant, that's the word I was looking for. The tyrant uh, who sought out uh, the wife of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So this hadith, as I mentioned, is in from Sahih al-Bukhari, the book of the stories of the prophets. <coughs> uh, hadith number 3358. Al-Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala, he brings with his chain of narration to Abi Hurairah radiallahu anhu who said uh, who said that the Prophet uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, did not he did not tell a lie uh, except on uh, three occasions Ibrahim alayhi salam did not tell a lie except on three uh, occasions twice for the sake of Allah when he said I am sick right when he when his people they had the big gathering 
and he stayed behind and he said, Inni Saqim, I am sick. Uh, and we all know this, that, that portion of the story. Um, and the second time he said, when he said, I have not done this, uh, meaning, but the big, you know, the big one did it. The big one, meaning the big idol, uh, he did it. That was the second time. He said the third was while Ibrahim salam and Sarah were going on their journey, they passed by a tyrant from amongst the tyrants. Someone said to the tyrant, this man, this man meaning Ibrahim salam, is accompanied by a very charming lady, meaning she was beautiful. She was very, very beautiful. Sarah was very, very beautiful. And that's going to, and that's a, as a ma'luma, it's a piece of information uh, that we're going to need uh, in future discussions uh, whenever we are able to get to the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. So just keep that ma'luma or keep that piece of information in the back uh, of your mind that Sarah, uh, the wife of Ibrahim alayhi <coughs> salam, was extremely, she was extremely beautiful. Jazakumullah um, khairah. Barakallah fikum. So he goes on here, he says, so he sent, for, so this tyrant, he sent for Ibrahim and asked him about Sarah, saying, who is this lady? So Ibrahim alayhi salam said, she is my sister. And Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar rahimahullah, he said that what he intended by that is she's my sister in religion. Uh, and the reason why <coughs> he used this, uh, you, he, he said that she's my sister is because had he said, this is my wife, then the tyrant most likely would have killed Ibrahim so that he can get to his wife. So he said, this is my sister. Uh, so Ibrahim, alayhi salam, he went to Sarah and said, O oh Sarah, there are no believers on the surface of the earth except you and I. At this point, he said, at this point, there's no believers on the earth except you and I. So we, in order, in order to keep Allah's religion uh, propagated and Allah's worship present on the earth, you know, we need to do what we need to do. So... Uh, he said, O Sarah, there are no believers on the surface of the earth except you and I. This man asked me about you, and I've told him that you are my sister. So don't contradict my statement. The tyrant then called Sarah, and when she went to him, he tried to take hold of her with his hand, but his hand got stiff, and he was confounded, meaning he wasn't able to touch her. He wasn't able to touch her. He asked Sarah, pray to Allah for me, and I shall not harm you. So Sarah asked Allah to cure him, and he got cured. So she made this dua as upon his request, and uh, he, he got cured. He tried to take hold of her for a second time. Okay, so he lied. He tried to take hold of her, of her for the second time. And his hand got stiffed, <clears throat> uh, or stiffer than the, what it was before. And once again, he was confounded. He again requested, uh, Sarah, pray to Allah for me, and I will not harm you. Sarah asked Allah again, and he became all right. He then called one of his guards uh, who had brought her and said, You have not brought me a human being, you have brought me a shaitan. Like, this is not a, like, anytime I try to go to touch her, like, I get, like, I get stuck, like, I can't move. So this isn't a person that you brought to me. You've brought me a shaitan. So the tyrant then gave uh, a slave girl by the name of Hajar. It was a slave girl by the name of Hajar. He gave her Hajar to Sarah. Now this is a way basically trying to make peace. Because now he's scared of her. You know, she's a shaitan. She's a devil. <coughs> like she can harm me. So as a way to make peace... So she doesn't harm him. Gave her a gift. Right, well, what was the gift? A slave girl. What was the slave girl's name? Hajar. Hajar. Uh, so he gave Hajar as a girl servant to Sarah. Sarah came back to Ibrahim while he, was, while he was offering the salat. And Ibrahim 
uh, he gestured with his hand and asked what happened. So she replied, Allah has spoiled the evil plot of the kafir, of the disbeliever. Allah has spoiled the evil plot of the disbeliever and he gave me hajjah for service. So not only did nothing happen to me, right, which that was, that was what they were hoping, that no harm would come to her. Not only did that happen, but she came back with some, he gave her something, hajjah. Uh, and then Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, he addressed uh, the people and he said, Tilka ummukum ya bani ma'is sama. This is your mother, O children of the water of the sky. <coughs> now, what this means, the meaning of the statement of Abu Huraira, this is your mother, O children of the water of the sky, uh, he's referring to the fact that. Ismail is the son of Hajar. And as we're going to see, inshallah ta'ala, in just a few minutes, Hajar was nourished from the water from the well of Zamzam. And the well of Zamzam is waters from the sky, as it was mentioned by Ibn Hibban, rahimahullah ta'ala. And so uh, Hajar was nourished from this water which in turn Ismail السلام, was nourished from this water and the children of Ismail are now the children are known as the children of the water of the sky. So this is what Abu Huraira who said, Tilka ummukum, this is your mother. <coughs> this is your mother. And this statement that this is your mother and when Abu Huraira was speaking to uh, the Arabs in front of him will become a little bit more clear over the next few classes, inshallah ta'ala. <coughs> so this is Hajar. So Hajar was a slave girl that was owned by the tyrant of Musr, which he then in turn gifted to Sarah. Now after they left, after leaving that place and they moved on with life, uh, fast forwarding a little bit in time, Sarah became old. Sarah became old and she did not have children. Until this point in her old age, she did not have children. And so uh, Ibrahim السلام, used to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him offspring. And Sarah knew the desire of Ibrahim السلام, to have children. So Sarah gifted Hajar to Ibrahim. السلام. Hajar gifted, Afwan, uh, Sarah gifted Hajar to Ibrahim السلام, for the purpose of uh, him to be able to have children. <coughs> so Hajar became pregnant. And she used to hide her pregnancy. She used to hide her pregnancy until uh, she actually gave birth. Uh, and then there was some, what we call ghira, that took place between Sarah and, uh, and Hajar. Sarah, and a woman, being a woman, uh, obviously, you know, she and her husband weren't able to have children, but he went and had, he had a, he had a child, with this lady and Sarah felt something. And so there was some tension. And so there was some tension. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, ordered for Ibrahim alayhi salam to take Hajar away. Now mind you, as we're going to see in the hadith that we're going to read, that this was not just Hajar leaving, was not for the simple purpose of pleasing Sarah. Right, it wasn't just for that purpose. But Allah Azza wa Jal had a plan that was much greater than just the ghira of uh, the wife of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And so, uh, Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, he mentions in the second hadith <coughs> that we're going to read this evening. Um, it's the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah. Uh, <coughs> It's hadith number 3000, 
364. So the last hadith was 3,358. And this hadith is uh, number 3,364. So Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, he brings with his chain of narration to Abdullah ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, uh, who said uh, that the first person um, well, on, the authority, Afwan, on the authority of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam That the first lady to use a girdle Was the mother of Ismail You know what a girdle That's the You know that thing that women tie around their Their bodies To make them uh, I guess seem uh, Thinner than what they are uh, Allah knows best as to What are all of the different reasons That uh, You know women we use uh, the girdle, but the, the, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the first woman to use the girdle was the mother of Ismail, uh, so that she might hide her tracks from Sarah. I Meaning she was pregnant. She was pregnant. <coughs> and so, so that she didn't show, she would use uh, this girdle. Ibrahim Alayhi Salam brought her and her son, Ismail, while she used to nurse him. Uh, to a place near the Kaaba under the tree on the spot of Zamzam. So, there, as we mentioned, because in this hadith it doesn't mention it clearly, but there's other narrations that do, that show that there was some tension. And so Ibrahim alayhi salam was ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remove Hajar. So where did he take her? The Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he took her to a place near the Kaaba but the Kaaba wasn't there at the time, where the Kaaba will eventually be. So he took her to a place near the Kaaba under a tree on the spot of Zamzam. Once again, the well of Zamzam was not there at the time. Uh, at the highest place near the masjid. During those days, there was nobody in Mecca, nor was there any water. Remember, it was, it was just nothing but desert. So he made them sit over there and placed them near a leather bag containing some dates and a small water skin containing some water. Right, so he put them there, gave them a bag of dates and a container of water. And he set off to go home. Told him, stay, you guys stay right here. And he started leaving. And so <clears throat> Ismail's mother followed him saying, oh Ibrahim, where are you going? leaving us in this valley where there is no person whose company we may enjoy, nor is there anything to enjoy. She repeated that to him many times, but he did not look back at her. He just kept walking. He didn't even look back at her. <coughs> then she asked, Allahu amaraka bihada? Was it Allah that ordered you to do this? He said, yes. So then she said, Something amazing. She said, then he, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he will not neglect us. He will not neglect us. Look at the iman of Hajar. I mean, which one of us would be dropped off with one container of dates, one container of water in the middle of the desert, no one around, and you're told, Allah has commanded you to stay here. You're like, you know what? Allah is going to take care of us. Like, that's Iman. No, she didn't scream at him. Once, I mean, before, she's, what are you doing? Why are you leaving us here? But once she realized that this was Allah's command, she stopped. And she put her trust and her faith and her reliance in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's not going to neglect us. Even though I don't understand, even though I don't know what's going to happen and how it's going to happen. But if this is Allah's command and this is His will, then Allah Ta'ala is not going to neglect us. Allah is going to take care of us. And so, uh, and He returned uh, while Ibrahim, she went back. She stopped chasing Him and returned back to where He told her, He left her. And then Ibrahim alayhi salam proceeded onwards. And on reaching uh, where they could not see him, 
He turned and faced the Kaaba, meaning turned to face where the Kaaba will eventually be. <coughs> and he started raising his hands, invoking Allah Ta'ala, saying, O oh, our Lord, I have made some of my offspring to dwell in an uncultivated valley by your sacred house, so that they may give thanks uh, to the end of the ayat. Well, Ibrahim السلام, made the dua for Allah to protect uh, his uh, family. So Ismail's, so the Prophet ﷺ, he goes on, he says, Ismail's mother went on uh, breastfeeding Ismail and drinking from the water. When the water and the water skin had all been used up, she became thirsty and her child also became thirsty. And this is because the woman's milk uh, is directly uh, affected by the things that she eats and, and, or, doesn't, or doesn't eat, things that she drinks or doesn't drink. And so when the water from the water skin dried up, so the milk was affected. So she became thirsty and her child became thirsty. So she started looking at the child tossing in agony. So now Ismail is, you know, he's a baby, he's tossing, he's crying. Uh, any of you who have, have ever had newborn babies, uh, you know how uh, when they start crying, how it starts to affect you. So she left him, for she could not endure looking at him, and found that the mountain of Safa was the nearest mountain to her on that land. So she stood on it. I mean, she went up to Safa. We all know the famous mountain Safa in, in Mecca, where we make um, the Sa'i between the mountains. So she went up to Safa. Uh, she started looking at the valley. Uh, keenly so that she might see somebody, but she cannot see anyone. Then she descended from Safa, and when she descended from a Safa, oh, and when she reached to the valley, she, uh, she tucked up her robe and ran in the valley like a person in distress and trouble, till she crossed the valley and reached to Al Marwa. So she, she stood on a Safa, and she looked to see if she could see anyone. She didn't see anyone. There's no one for miles around. No, no, no one in sight. So she comes down and when she reaches the valley, she, she tucks up her robe and she, she runs towards Al Marwa. Then when she gets to Marwa, uh, she stood and started looking, expecting to see someone, but she cannot see anybody. And she repeated that between Safa and Marwa seven times. She repeated that. How many times? Seven. Seven times. Ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhumah, he added that the Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is the source of the sa'i, or the people between, uh, going between Safa and Marwa. So this is what the sunnah uh, that we practice when making hajj, that we're going uh, between uh, Safa and Marwa, that, that practice, came from the, with the, the action of Hajar. Um, the Prophet goes on, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, when she reached Al Marwa for the last time, she heard a voice and she asked herself to be quiet and listen attentively. She heard the voice again and said, O oh, whoever you may be, you have made me hear your voice. Have you got something to help me? And behold, she saw an angel at the place of Zamzam digging the earth with his heel. And some, and some people have said wasn't his heel, was a wing. Allah Ta'ala knows best. But the angel was digging the well of, uh, was digging the well of Zamzam. Uh, he was digging the earth with his heel or his wing till water flowed from that place. She started to make something like a basin around it using her hands uh, and started filling her water skin with water with her hands and the water was flowing out after uh, she had scooped some of it. The Prophet ﷺ added, May Allah bestow mercy on Ismail's mother as she let Zamzam flow, um, then it would have been a river or a stream flowing on the surface of the earth. Meaning so what happened was after the angel struck water, the water started gushing out. Hajar was smart. 
He was a very intelligent woman. An intelligent woman, woman of faith. Not just a person of faith, but intelligence as far as she was keen and witty. Um, and she saw the water. Now she's desperately in need of water. The first thing she does, right, is before she even starts to drink, what's the first thing she does? She starts to contain it. Like, I need this water. I can't waste this. So the first, she's thinking, thinking ahead. This is good water. I'm not going to waste it. Let me save it. Once she built up a way to save it and preserve it, then she filled up her water skin and started to drink. Uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he further added that then she drank water and, and she breastfed her child. The angel said to her, don't be afraid of being neglected, for this is the house of Allah, which will be built by this boy and his father. This is the house of Allah that will be built by this boy and his father. And Allah n never neglects his people. Allah Ta'ala never neglects his people. <coughs> uh, who would have thought that no no how could Hajj could have how, how could she have ever imagined oh, Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah how could she have ever imagined that you know an angel is going to come down and, and dig a well in the middle of a desert where there's no one you know la yutawqa an yakun fi hadha al mawdi ma you know it's not no one would have thought that this is a place where there's going to be water it's absolute desert it's desert around miles and miles. She stood on the mountain looking around. There's nothing. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he never neglects his people. The house at that time was on a high place resembling uh, a hillock. And when torrents came, they flowed to the right and left. She lived in that way till some people from the tribe of Jurham or a family from Jurham past her and her child. Uh, so we'll stop for just a second, inshallah ta'ala. Um, Jurhum is a tribe from Yemen. Jurhum is a tribe from Yemen. And they used to travel between Yemen and Asham and different places. And they would pass by this valley, the valley of Mecca. <coughs> As I said at that time, it was just a simple valley, just a valley uh, with nothing there. And so they were, pass, they were passing by, and I believe they're on their way back to, back to Al-Yemen. Jurhum is one of the tribes or the original tribes of Arabs. The Arabs are two types. Al-Arab, Al-Ariba, Al-Arab. Al Musta'araba. The Arabs are two types the original Arabs, and then you have what they call the Arabs who were Arabized, the Arabized Arabs. So the original Arabs are the tribes like Ad and Thamud uh, and Al Qahtan, Jurhum. These were Arab tribes who, who are, are direct descendants. From the son of Nuh alayhi salam, Sam. They're descendants of Nuh alayhi salam. Uh, he, oh, he had sons. One of them, his name was Sam. And Sam is the father of the Arabs. He's the, all the, uh, the original Arabs go back to uh, the children of Sam. And so Jurham was from these original Arabs. He's from the original Arabs. <coughs> The Arabized Arabs are from the lineage of Ismail. The Arabized Arabs are from the lineage of Ismail. Uh, we're going to get into that in just a second, inshallah ta'ala. So he says that some of the tribes, uh, some people from the tribe of Jurham passed her by. Uh, they were coming through the way of the Kaaba, meaning that valley. Uh, they landed in the lower part of Mecca where they saw a bird that had uh, a habit of flying around water and not leaving it so there was a bird or some birds you know when they have water they're circling over the water so they said 
this bird must be flying around water, though we know that there is no water in this valley. Right, so it shows us that Jurhum, this valley was not unknown to them because they passed through it on their travels. This valley, we know that there's no water here, but that bird, it's circling over the, you know, it, we know that this is a bird when it, when it flies like this, it's flying over water. But we know this valley and we know that there's no water in this valley. So now this is, this is strange to them. So they sent one or two messengers who discovered the source of the water and returned to inform them of the water. So they all came to the water. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said that Ismail's mother was sitting near the water. They asked her, do you allow us to stay with you? And you look at the, I mean, at that time, you look at the people had honor. You know, people had, I mean, it was just, it was Hajar and her child. They were a large group. They could have just, you know, killed her and ran, you know, and, and, and dumped her somewhere and just took the water. But when they arrived, they saw her sitting at the water and asked for permission. Is it, you know, is it okay? Uh, do you allow us to stay with you? She replied, yes, but you have no right to possess the water. Look, again, I told you, this, this, this woman was extremely intelligent. She didn't just say, yes, you know, you know, come, you can stay here with me. Yes, but the water, you don't own it. Who owns it? It's my water. You can stay here. But you have no rights over the water, meaning you don't own the water because it's mine. And the woman was, as we said, Hajar, was extremely intelligent. Uh, <clears throat> and they agreed. The Prophet wasallam said uh, that they agreed to that. The Prophet wasallam further said, Ismail's mother was pleased with the whole situation as she used to love to enjoy the company of the people. So now she has water there's people around and now she has people to talk to because she was alone she just had a baby the baby and her child couldn't even talk back because he's an infant and so now she has uh, the comfort of being able to talk to to people so they settled there the tribe of Jurhum settled here in Mecca or what will now will be known to us today as, as Mecca um, <clears throat> And later on, they sent for their families who came and settled with them so that some families became permanent residents there. So these travelers, uh, they sent for their families to leave Yemen, to come here. And so now they have set up a permanent residence. Now they have made Mecca as a permanent place of residence. The child, meaning Ismail, السلام, grew up, right? He grew up. And he learned uh, Arabic from them. He learned تَعَلَّمَ الْعَرَبِيَةَ ta مِنْهُمْ This is important because this shows us that some people have, have, have said that Ismail السلام, is the first person to have ever spoken Arabic. He's the father of the Arabs. All the Arabs come from him. He's the first person to speak Arabic. And this hadith shows us that this is not the case because where did his, his father Ibrahim السلام, was not Arab. His mother Hajar was also not Arab. Where did he learn Arabic from? Did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just give it to him? No. He learned it. He learned Arabic from the tribe of Jurhum. And this is why we say that, yes, Ismail السلام, is the father of the Arabized Arabs. And also, yes, there are narrations that show that he, that Ismail is the one who, uh, who gave fasaha to the, he's the first person to speak the Arabic language uh, with fasaha, to take the Arabic language and, and to speak it with a, uh, in a classical, very, very, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to figure out how we translate fasih or fasaha, how would you translate that into English? No, not not so. We don't call it pure. Um, you know, when a person is speaking, and he's it not. It's not just proper, but it's a, it's in a way that 
produces meaning. It's it's beautiful. The, the speech itself is beautiful. Eloquent. eloquent. Yes, Jazakum Allah khairan. He was the first, he brought eloquency to the Arabic language. But yes, that's, that is correct. But if Ismail alayhi salam was not the first person to speak uh, the Arabic language. He actually learned Arabic from the tribe of Jurhum, as the Prophet said here in this hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa ta'allama al arabiyyata minhum. And he also and he learned from them virtues that caused them to love and admire him as he grew up. So as he's growing up, <coughs> he's learning their language, he's learning their customs, he's learning their virtues, and it caused the tribe of Jurhum to have love for Ismail alayhi salam. The Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and when Ismail reached the age of puberty, they made him or they, uh, they made him marry a woman from amongst them. Right? So he married from the tribe of Jurhum. So he learned from them. He also married from them. Right? So his children, the children of Ismail, right, had a father who learned Arabic and became eloquent in the Arabic language. And their mother was from the pure Arabs, or the original Arabs, I should say. They were from the original Arabs. Or she was from the original Arabs from the tribe of uh, Jurhum. And so uh, the Prophet goes on, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, after Ismail's mother had died, Ibrahim Alayhi Salam came after Ismail's marriage in order to see his family that he had left long ago. But he did not find Ismail. Uh, when he asked Ismail's wife about him, she replied, he has gone in search of our livelihood. Then he asked her about their way of living and their condition. And she replied, we are living in misery. We are living in hardship and destitution, complaining to him. Now this lady doesn't even know who this man is. Right? Some stranger shows up at the door and says, I'm looking for Ismail. She says, oh, he's not here. He's out looking for livelihood. Oh, how y'all doing? Uh, we're, we're living in misery. So now she's complaining. Right, to, some, to, to a complete stranger. She's complaining to a complete stranger. She says, we're living in misery. We're living in a hardship and destitution, complaining to him. <coughs> he said, when your husband returns, convey my salutations, convey my salams to him, and tell him to change the threshold of his gate. When Ismail came, he seemed to have felt something unusual. So he asked his wife, has anyone visited you? She replied, yes, an old man of, uh, of so-and-so description came and asked me about you and I informed him and he asked about our state of living and I told him that we were living in hardship and poverty. On that, Ismail said, did he advise you anything? She replied, yes. He told me to convey his salams to you and tell you to change the threshold of your gate. So Ismail said, it was my father and he has ordered me to divorce you. Go back to your family. My father showed, like, my father came here and he told me to divorce you, so leave. Like, you're divorced. Uh, and this shows us the importance of women not complaining uh, to, and this, this compla especially complaining to strangers. As I know, in, 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 in doing uh, marriage counseling uh, for over 20 years, sometimes this is one of the complaints of the brothers. Uh, that the wife is complaining to whoever will listen. Whoever will listen, she'll complain. Doesn't even matter if, she, if the person she's complaining to is for her, against her. Just as long as they'll listen, she'll complain. And this is not a good characteristic. This is not a good characteristic. Our complaints should go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If, 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 if a lady has a complaint where she's being oppressed or she's being wronged, or her rights are being taken from her, then her complaint to, has to go to someone who can do something about it. Her complaint should not just be for the sake of complaining, because that's not a good characteristic. If, if it's something that's necessary to be complained about, then she goes to the person of authority that can actually do something about fixing her situation. But as far as complaining just for the sake of complaining, this is not good characteristic. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. So Ismail divorced her and married another woman.
from amongst them. I mean, now, this shows you the good relationship that Ismail had with the tribe of Jorhum. Because imagine, Abu Anas, you're the, you're the head of the tribe. And you marry someone off who's not from you, mind you. He's not from your tribe. Right? He's not even Arab. But you marry him off. And then out of nowhere, because his father said so, everything was going okay. His father arrives, says, divorce her. He just says, okay, you're, she's divorced. Now he comes back to the tribe. What's going to happen at the tribe? They're going to say, we already married you once. Right? We already married you once, and you divorced the woman. But he went back to them, and they remarried him. It shows how much... Uh, uh, how close Ismail salam, was with the tribe and how impressed they were with, uh, with Ismail salam. Um, so they married another woman from amongst them uh, then Ibrahim salam, stayed away for a period as long as Allah wished and called upon them again but did not find Ismail so when he came to Ismail's wife and asked her about Ismail she said he has gone in search of our livelihood Ibrahim alayhi salam asked her, how are, how are you getting on? Asking about their sustenance and their living. She said, we are prosperous and well off. Uh, meaning we're, we're doing good. We're doing good. Um, then she thanked Allah azza wa jal. She said, we're doing good and thanked Allah. So Ibrahim asked, what kind of food do you eat? She said, meat. He said, what do you drink? She said, water. He said, O oh Allah, bless their meat and water. So the Prophet, والسلام, he added, at that time, they did not have any grain. Um, and if they had grain, he would have also asked Allah to bless that grain. So the Prophet, وسلم, uh, he added, if somebody has only these two things as his sustenance, his health and disposition will be badly affected unless he lives in Mecca. Unless he lives in Mecca. Tayyib. The Prophet Ali Salatu he goes on, he says, Then Ibrahim, he said to Ismail's wife, When your husband comes, give him my salams and tell him that he should keep firm the threshold of his gate. When Ismail came back, he asked his wife, Did anyone come to visit you? She said, Yes. A good looking old man came to me. Now look at the difference between the first wife and the second wife. The first wife, uh, an old guy came. She says, a good-looking old guy uh, shows up. Um, so she praised him and added, he asked about you. And I informed him, and he asked about our livelihood, and I told him that we were in good condition. Ismail asked her, did he give you any piece of advice? She said, yes. He told me to give you salams, and he ordered that you should keep firm the threshold of your gate. On that, Ismail said, it was my father, and you are the threshold. He ordered me to keep you with me. And then Ibrahim salam, stayed away for a period of time, uh, as long as Allah wished, and he came to visit them afterwards. He saw Ismail under a tree near the well of Zamzam, sharpening his arrows. When he saw Ibrahim, he rose up and welcomed him. They greeted each other as a father does with his son, or a son does with his father. Ibrahim, he said, O Ismail, Allah has given me an order. So, o Ismail, Allah has given me an order. Ismail said, do what your Lord has ordered you to do. Now Ibrahim salam, has not even explained what the order is. He hasn't even said, this is what I've been ordered to do. When, when Ismail heard that Allah has given his father an order, he said, O my father, do what you've been ordered to do. And look at the, 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 the religion of Ismail alayhi uh, salam. So Ibrahim, he said, will you help me? Ismail said, I will help you. Ibrahim, he said, Allah has ordered me to build a house here, pointing to the hill higher than the land surrounding it. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he added, then they raised the, the, the foundations of the house Ismail brought the stones and Ibrahim 
was building and when the walls became high, Ismail brought this stone. This stone is referring to what? The black stone? Maqam Ibrahim. This is the stone that uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he stood on. It's the stone he stood on. He brought the stone and he put it for Ibrahim who stood over it and carried on building. While Ismail was handing him the stones and both of them were saying, O oh, our Lord, accept this service from us. Verily you are the all-hearer, the all-knower. The Prophet wasallam added, Then both of them went on building and going around the Kaaba saying, O oh, our Lord, accept this service from us. Verily you are the all-hearer, the all-knower. So this is uh, the building of the Kaaba. This is the building of the Kaaba. And we see from this, um, the Kaaba is the first masjid built to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the earth. Allah ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Ali Imran, Inna awwala baytin wudi'a linnasi lalladhi bi bakkata mubaraka uh, Allah says, indeed the first house الناس, It was placed for the people Is the one in Bekka Bekka referring to Mecca And we're going to talk about in our next class inshallah, Why Mecca is called Bekka It is blessed and is guidance for the Alameen In the hadith in Bukhari uh, On the authority of Abi Dhar anhu, Abu Dhar he said, O Messenger of Allah which was the first masjid built on the earth? The Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Masjid Al-Haram, meaning the Masjid in Mecca. Then Abu Dhar said, Then which? The Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, right? the Masjid in Jerusalem. So Abu Dhar, he said, Kam kana baynahuma? How long was it between the building of the Masjid Al-Haram and the Masjid Al-Aqsa? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Arba'una sana, 40 years. And so the first masjid to ever be built was Al-Masjid Al-Haram in Mecca. It was built by Ibrahim Alayhi Salam and it was built by, with the assistance of his son Ismail. And uh, we're going to see as we continue in our classes that Quraysh, the people during the time of the Prophet والسلام, they knew about Ibrahim. And they knew about Ibrahim and they knew about Ismail. And they knew about the Tawheed that they practiced. And we're going to see some of the hadith uh, uh, that we're going to talk about inshallah. Uh, if I don't mention next in our next class about how we can prove, how do we prove that the people of Mecca uh, knew about Ibrahim alayhi salam and what he was upon uh, ask me but someone remind me and say you said you're going to mention the hadith because it's starting to get a little bit late so we'll delay that inshallah ta'ala to uh, our next class bi'ithnillahi ta'ala does anybody have uh, any questions about what we have talked about Tawadu no Shaykh Yo salam. Mm -hmm. Allah knows best. Um, that may have been before Lut. It's possible that this was all. This all took place uh, before Lut, because you remember Lut came at a time when Ishaq was getting ready to be born. Right? Lut was present. Remember when, the, when in, in, we look at uh, the Quran, it tells us that when the angels came to visit Ibrahim on their way to destroy the people of Lut, it's at that time they, uh, they told, uh, they gave the Bushra, they gave the good news to Ibrahim about Ishaq. And so Ishaq, this, so this took place before, well before uh, the angels going to destroy Lut. So it's possible, and Allah knows best, it's possible that all of this took place 
before Lut uh, was either A, before he was born, or after he was born, but before uh, he was given uh, revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah ta'ala knows best. I don't know about that statement. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know about that statement. No, tfadl. They were able to speak Arabic. Um, I don't know. It's possible. It's possible because they were people who traveled. And so they used to have, there were diff different tribes of different languages. And so, uh, just like in the world today, when you leave America, I think Americans were like, we're the one of the few places where you only speak one language. Uh, most other places that you go to, the people speak multiple languages. Um, and so and it was like that at that time, because in order for you to get around, because you know, they were from Palestine, and now they were in Egypt. Right? They're moving around, they're, 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 Ibrahim alayhi salam is in Syria, he's in Egypt, Palestine, he's, he's in different places, and they're speaking different languages in these different places. So what I'm assuming is, and again, this is just an assumption, is that from their travels and meeting different people, they were able to communicate to a certain degree in multiple languages, and Allah Ta'ala knows best. Huh? No, this is, uh, so it's not mentioned in this hadith. No, this must have uh, this must have happened in between. This must have happened in between because he was a, he was because when when Ibrahim alayhi salam went to slaughter uh, his son Ismail, he was uh, a young he was he was just barely uh, he was just uh, young enough or old enough now to start walking around and be without needing the assistance of his father. So he's, he's mature enough that his father doesn't have to keep holding his hand and you know, where are you, stay right here. Um, now he's able to walk with his father without having to have that level of assistance. So how old is that? What's eight, nine, ten years old, something like that. So this was around the age of Ismail alayhi salam when, uh, when Allah azza wa commanded him to slaughter his son. But is that, that, that process was not mentioned uh, in, in the hadith. Now mind you, because a person may think, well Ibrahim alayhi salam left them in, left his wife, or he left, uh, he left Hajar and, and, and Ismail in, in this valley, a desert, and he doesn't come back until his son Ismail is a grown man and, and, and has a wife. La. Now Ibrahim alayhi salam, he would come and he would visit his, uh, and, and he raised his son. How do you think Ismail knew about Allah Azza wa Jal and the da'wah of Islam? And, and how do you think he learned all of that? He learned that from his father, Ibrahim, alayhi salam. So his father wasn't an absent father. He was involved uh, with his son and he used to travel long distance to see his son. It just, just so happened that it wasn't mentioned in this hadith. Now, Allah Ta'ala knows best. Now, uh, I want to say he went back to Palestine because that's when that's that's after he left after Mesh al Haram was built, Mesh al Aqsa was built in, in, in Palestine. Now, I want so this I want to say he went back to Palestine, but let me uh, this is. What I remember, but I go back and check, inshallah. But I'm thinking he, he walked from Palestine to Mecca and asked his wife, How are you doing? and then leave. He doesn't stay. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's what I was thinking. But, uh, 
But he didn't. He didn't stay and wait for Ismail to come back. Because he also had another, he has a family that he left behind. So he came to check. Now he has to go back because he's still responsible. Um, and Allah knows best as to when, she, when, when, when the wife of Ismail, when she said he went out searching for livelihood, that could have meant that he went out and traveled. Because Jorhum was known as a tribe that used to travel for trading. And he would travel and, and do trading. So he might have been, he, he could have been gone for months. He could have been gone for months. And Allah knows best when, as to when uh, Ismail was going to return. So maybe that's the reason why he, he left without even seeing his son. And he didn't wait. Allah Ta'ala knows best. Now. No more questions, inshallah. We'll stop here. And we will uh, continue, inshallah. Next week, we're going to speak about, we're going to start, uh, we were going to, you know, this was one of the, the issues I was trying to debate with myself as to how much detail we were going to go in. And some of the brothers had suggested, you know, let's try to do as much detail as possible. So inshallah, ta'ala, now that we've talked about the tribe of Jurhum, then we're going to move into the next stage the children of Ismail and the establishment of Mecca and you know how things progressed uh, throughout the generations. Uh, I'm going to try as my, my best to only mention the things that are extremely important because uh, some, some of the details of this uh, may or may not necessarily be as important to us right now. So until we're going to get to, because there's some aspects before the Prophet's birth, والسلام, there are certain things that are going to be important. Uh, some of the people, some of the events that took place before the birth of the Prophet والسلام, is going to be important for us uh, to kind of cover so that we can understand some of the events that took place after the birth of the Prophet والسلام, and some of the things that he said والسلام, that were connected to some of the events that took place before uh, his birth. So we're going to try to cover that as much as possible bin Allah Ta'ala. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us and bless us and guide us. Ask Allah azza wa to protect the Muslims. May Allah accept from us our good deeds and our righteous actions. May He pardon us all of our sins and forgive us of our mistakes. Hadha wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabiyana Muhammad. Oh, there's a comment here uh, from one of the brothers, Jazallah Khaira, um, mentioning that uh, Ibrahim and, and Sarah came from Al Iraq. Yes, that is the origin. That's their origin. However, the question that was asked was in reference to where, after th this whole thing takes place, when this as this story is going on, where did they move back to? Where were they living at? Uh, and and I don't believe they they went back to Al Iraq. I don't believe that they went back to Al Iraq, uh, but rather they went back to Palestine and Allah Ta'ala knows best. Uh, but inshallah Ta'ala will go back and double check just to confirm. May Allah Ta'ala help us and guide us.